Magandang gabi po sa inyong lahat. Good evening, Philippines. This is Teresa Pantaversosa of Empower Philippines. Good morning, America. This is Dr. Jude. We are live streaming from Seattle. Teresa and I are founders of uh, Empower Philippines, a nonprofit charity organization based in Washington State. We were founded in 2013, and it has been our mission to empower the least, the last, and the lost. Uh, this podcast program is, is called Coffee Conversations. We are delighted to be joined again by Dr. Scott Hahn, who is the Father Michael Scanlon Professor of Biblical Theology and the New Evangelization at the Franciscan University of Steubenville. He is the founder and president of the St. Paul Center and the author and editor of over 40 popular and academic books. All are familiar with his selling books, such as Rome Sweet Home, The Lamb's Supper, and Hail Holy Queen. On our last podcast with him, we talked about his book titled Hope to Die, The Christian Meaning of Death and the Resurrection of the Body. Today, we will talk about his latest book with Brandon McKinley titled, It is Right and Just, Why the Future of Civilization Depends on True Religion. This week is a special week. Today is the feast day of St. Joseph, the patriarch and the glorious patron of the Universal Church. On March 16, we also celebrated in the Philippines our 500 year anniversary of being a Catholic Christian nation. And because tonight or this morning, we have Dr. Scott Hahn. Welcome, Dr. Scott Hahn. It is wonderful to be with you again. And I bless the Feast of St. Joseph to you and to all of those who are with us. Thank you, Dr. Hahn. Dr. Hahn, I, I want to set this up properly for our Filipino viewers. Um, I wonder if we could talk for a little bit about secularism as it occurs in both of our nations, because I think it will highlight how relevant and how providential, maybe even prophetic, your book is. It is right and just why the future of civilization depends on true religion. Yes, good question. So, you know, in our tradition as Catholics, we make distinctions all the time. But as St. Thomas Aquinas would put it, we distinguish in order to unite, right? So we distinguish between Jesus' humanity and his divinity, not to oppose them, obviously, or to separate them, but to show how they're united in Jesus. More practically, in our own experience, we also distinguish between secularity and that which is sacred, not to separate or to oppose them, but to show how they're united, they're coordinated, they're balanced. And so we need to distinguish between secularism on the one hand and secularity on the other, because secularity is good. The temporal order, the physical, the uh, social, the political, the economic, all of these things are good, but they're not all there is. And so when we recognize in the beginning how God created the heavens and the earth, six days he created all things, just as he commands us to work for six days. But our work is ordered to worship. That which is secular is ordered to that which is sacred. And so if we understand that our labor is sanctified through liturgy, our work is ordered to worship, our lives individually and socially are ordered to God, we can see how it is that religion is not something strange, it isn't something extrinsic or alien to human experience. In fact, it's essential. And this isn't just a Catholic bias. This isn't even just a Christian belief. You see this in Islam and Buddhism and others, but you also go back all, all the way to Greco-Roman culture and some of the most profound public intellectuals in antiquity, like Plato and Aristotle, like Cicero and Seneca, recognize that there was a role for religion that today secularists would exclude, would oppose. They would say religion is private. Religion is something irrelevant to justice and to law and to the social order. In fact, if you bring it into the public square and into your social discourse, it is downright dangerous and it must be excluded. That's what we mean by secularism. And that's how we distinguish it from a kind of healthy, natural secularity because in fact, what we hear in the church's teaching all the way back in Vatican II is that as lay people, we are to sanctify the temporal order. And so we're not just sanitizing, we're not just cleaning up, we're really ordering everything that we do that is natural 
supernatural to everything we're called to be, which is supernatural. And once again, we come back to the Catholic faith and we realize it has this unique power to form civilizations. But even more than that, it has this unique power to transform us into saints. And that's what's primary, to become saints. And the possibility of forming civilizations is real, it's important, but it's secondary. It's sort of what Jesus had in mind when he said, seek first the kingdom of heaven, and all these things will be added unto you. And I think that's sort of how we approach things as Catholics. It's always a both and. It's the secular and the sacred. It's not just secularism. And I think when we approach things that way and we articulate them, I think people are going to recognize that, you know what? That isn't, you know, imposing religion upon other people. That is proposing what, in a certain sense, constitutes our reality. Yes, it's so true. Uh, it's 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 almost about the compartmentalization of religion, Dr. Heim. You know, it reminds me of my readings of um, uh, uh, the Catholics or Catholicism in post-revolution America, where Catholics were the minority. They comprised about 1% of the 2 million uh, uh, British colonists. And even the founders of the nation during that time were denying citizenship to Catholics. Um, you had to first prove yourself. The Catholics had to prove themselves to be worthy of being Catholics and Americans at the same time. And, and, and they were required to self-regulate, uh, meaning to internalize their religion, to not be able to practice it outside of their, the, uh, outside of their own hearts and their own homes. Uh, don't you think so, Dr. Hahn? I think you're exactly right. I mean, Jude, honestly, there is a point at which people cross a line and they don't even know that they've crossed it. They don't even know that they've turned themselves around. They're facing the wrong direction. And I think that's what a lot of people in America are facing. You know, we've been through this pandemic and we're not out of it yet. We've also been through a traumatic presidential election mm -hmm. and we're not really seeing our way through that either. So what we have to recognize, whether we're in the Philippines or in America or anywhere else in the world, is that we've got to orient our lives to God. He is the beginning and he is the goal, the end. I'm reminded of a, a famous football player by the name of Jim Marshall, who we discuss in this book, It Is Right and Just, because Jim Marshall played defensive end for the Minnesota Vikings, and he holds all kinds of records. Uh, most consecutive games played most seasons, and yet he's not in the Hall of Fame. And people speculate as to why, but most likely it has to do with what happened in one game way back in October 25th, 1964, when the Vikings were playing a football game against the San Francisco 49ers, and their running back, the 49ers running back, Billy Kilmer, fumbled the ball. And Jim Marshall actually held the record, and still does, for the most fumbles recovered. He recovered Billy Kilmer's fumble and promptly ran it right back into the end zone. And to celebrate, he, he tossed the ball. And at that point, all of his teammates are surrounding him, not to congratulate him, but to berate him because he ran the wrong way. And he gave two points to the 49ers, which was a safety. Well, they fortunately won the game 27 to 22, but it should have been only 20 points. And it became famous almost overnight as the wrong way run. And it's not the case that Jim Marshall was betraying his teammates, committing athletic treason against you know, his own team, the Vikings. No, he, he sincerely believed that what he was doing was scoring a touchdown. You can be totally sincere and still be sincerely wrong, especially if you're running the wrong way. And you know, when you look at what people are doing in the football field of life, you know, sometimes we try to advance the ball and we get thrown for a loss or we're sacked. But the most important thing that we've got to do is make sure that we're pointing ourselves in the right direction. And this can easily, you know, this can easily, we can be easily disoriented because our culture is not just embracing secularity and ordering it to the sacred. They're really excluding the sacred and elevating the secular as though it is ultimate. And that's why we call it secularism. Whenever you take what is relative and you absolutize it, or you take mm -hmm. what is absolute and you relativize or privatize it, you know, the ancient Israelite prophets call that idolatry, because that which is infinite and eternal is the reason why we're here. And that which is finite and relative is good, but it needs to be sanctified. 
And so whether we're in America or whether we're in the Philippines or anywhere else, I think what we've got to do is recognize that the longer we live in a secularized culture, the longer we feel that pressure to privatize and to relativize the beliefs that we share that are really ultimate, I think we also, there's another illustration that I have in the book uh, about what happened one day in Sweden. Uh, two bank robbers entered this bank and took uh, four hostages and held them for five days. And uh, the police came in, they negotiated, and finally the prime minister of Sweden just gave the signal for them to use violent force. And so they, they took the two bank robbers and they released these four hostages after five days. But overnight there was this shock and sensation because the hostages began to speak in defense of their captors. And even during the trial, months later, they stood up and they, they berated the police for the use of tear gas, excessive force. And suddenly you realize that they wanted a helicopter. They wanted money. They began to speak not just of our captors, but of us. You know, and that's how that phrase, the Stockholm Syndrome, entered our vocabulary because we began to discover psychologists had never recognized the way in which people can cope. You know, sometimes you internalize the values of your captors just as a coping mechanism in order to get through the difficulties of life. And I, I think there's a spiritual Stockholm syndrome that takes hold of people. And in America, it happened very early after our founding when Catholics simply felt like second-class citizens. And that was true in the 1700s. It became even more true during the potato famine when Irish Catholics came over here and there were signs all over the place the Irish need not apply for these jobs. And not because they were Irish, but because they were Catholic and they were perceived as an alien presence. Well, of course, by the 1900s, most of that had changed, especially when John Fitzgerald Kennedy won the presidency in 1960. But we're still at a point now where we discover that part of the strategy for Kennedy to win was a famous talk that he gave in Dallas to Baptist ministers where he pledged to them and to all of America that he would keep his own Catholic beliefs to himself, you know, mm -hmm. under his vest, as it were. And, you know, I, I think we understand why he did that, but I do think that that is a combination of running the wrong way, you know, or else internalizing the values of a kind of captive culture. When in fact, the greatest gift we can give as patriotic citizens is to live out our faith freely and fully and to share it in a way that is generous and joyful. You know, whether you're American or Filipino, the fact is, as St. Paul tells us in Philippians 3, verse 20, that our citizenship is in heaven. And Paul uses the technical Greek term polytuma, which has to do with citizenship. You know, and so in effect, all of us have what you could call dual citizenship. I, I ran into somebody recently who is an Israeli citizen, as well as an American citizen. Well, dual citizenship is not all that common, but in fact, all Christians have that as our birthright. And so we recognize that we live out our faith in a secular society, but at the same time, we are called upon to, to sanctify the temporal order. You know, I'm always reminded of the last thing that Jesus gave to his disciples before he ascends into heaven. At the end of Matthew's gospel in chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, he says something remarkable. Obviously, they didn't forget it. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. That's how the Great Commission begins. And I'd like to point out that he doesn't say all authority in heaven has been given to me, but not on earth, at least not yet. No, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to Jesus because he's the creator, he's the redeemer, he's paid the price, and so... He doesn't say all authority in heaven and earth will be given to me at the end of time when I come back. It's his right now, whether we know it or not. He's the king of kings, the Lord of lords, regardless of who happens to be in the White House or in charge of any other national government. And so he goes on to say, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And once again, we need to distinguish. He doesn't simply say, go and make disciples within all nations. He actually says, go and make disciples of the nations themselves. And the term that he uses for disciple, you know, is not just someone who's willing to vote for a particular candidate. 
No, it's a disciplined student who studies under a master, a rabbi, like the disciples have been doing for years with Jesus. And the word for nations is ethne. So it's not necessarily these gargantuan secular nation states. Ethne means nations, but more in the sense of communities. And you discover early on the resistance that comes from Rome, this culture of death, this, this empire that is at war with Christ, until finally the faithful witness of Catholics for centuries, along with the blood of the martyrs, brings about the conversion of Constantine. But he doesn't really convert the empire by getting baptized. He got baptized because by that point, practically everyone in the empire was turning to Christ and discovering that here we find meaning for life and joy as well. And so if we look back and realize, wow, the seemingly impossible happened way back in antiquity, there's no reason to assume that it can't happen again. And even apart from the Roman Empire becoming Christendom, we've got the Armenians. We also have the Ethiopians. There were a number of places in India where uh, the Apostle Thomas went. And they still call themselves Thomas Christians. And they didn't necessarily transform the entire nation as we would see it. But their communities weren't just converted. They were radically transformed. This is what is so unique about our faith. It has this civilization forming power that brings peace and justice, not through force and coercion and fear. We'll take you know, hostages and we'll slay them unless you convert. No, it really is a kind of family faith that instills love and a sense of brotherhood, but also a sense of divine fatherhood. And through Our Lady, divine motherhood, <clears throat> excuse me, and through St. Joseph, this participation in God's own fatherhood. So what a perfect day for us to celebrate the fact that our faith is not only personal, private, and interior, but it's also social, it's public, and it's external. And the more I think we live that in a way that is both natural and supernatural, I think the more we may end up being surprised at what the Holy Spirit accomplishes through our ordinary activities in everyday life. So true, so true. Yeah, so Dr. Hahn, I can't help but share this. So next week, speaking of JFK, next week, my son, whom I'm homeschooling, his name is Zach, um, in his homeschool class, he will present by memory this impassioned speech of John F. Kennedy when he spoke in West Berlin, condemning the Berlin Wall. In the beginning of his speech, he's, JFK says, 2,000 years ago, the proudest boast is Kiwis Romanus Sum, which means I am a Roman citizen, asserting, uh, this is Cicero asserting his rights as a Roman citizen. Then JFK continues on, but today in the world of freedom, the proudest boast is Ich bin ein Berliner, which means I'm a Berliner. So you just mentioned how St. Paul says to Philippians 3.20 that our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. So that brings us really a point where our citizenship is not of right. th this world, but in heaven, even though Jude and I are Filipino Americans. So if I would like to probably continue on with the proudest boast slogans of Caesar and JFK, I might as well say, shouldn't we also say the proudest boast should be in our world and in heaven as it is in heaven should be I am a child of God. I am a Christian. I am a Catholic. That's right. And I love the way you put that for you. That is, I am a child of God. Not just I'm a Catholic. Certainly not just I'm an American. But a child of God? I mean, to other religions, that is not only an exaggeration. It crosses the boundary into blasphemy. And, and in fact, it would be presumptuous. It would be arrogant for us to be, cl be claiming to possess divine sonship, you know, Christ's own. You know, it, it really is important for us to press pause and to listen to ourselves and to hear us the way other people hear us, because no other religion claims that God is from all eternity a father, and that the son is therefore not younger, but co-eternal, and that the father, before he creates the world, is the father of the son, and the love that they share is the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. And so the one true God is three persons, 
and more of a family than the Hans could ever be. It's like, this is the most wonderful mystery. It exceeds our capacity to prove it philosophically or scientifically, but it is the highest mystery of faith. And then the incarnation, that the Father would send the Son down to these rebellious servants, who as creatures are nothing more than servants. We have no claim to divine sonship. I am a child of Fred and Molly Luhan, my dad and my mom. I am not a child of God, I'm a creature of God. But what I can't claim is what Jesus did by coming down to claim me and to claim you and to claim everybody. And so when he says, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, what he's saying is, impart to all, he's saying this to the apostles as he's getting ready to ascend into heaven, impart to all that which eye has not seen, ear has never heard, it's never entered into the mind or the heart of humans, what God made us for. This is not plan B, this is plan A. We are called upon to become sons and daughters of the Most High God through Christ and by the power of the Spirit to enter into this bond of being brothers and sisters. You know, other religions might claim a brotherhood, but you can't be brothers unless you share the same father and mother. And that's exactly why the Catholic faith is not just about individual salvation or about social legislation, but this wonder of wonders. You know, and by the time we get from the Trinity, this mystery that is so elusive and yet so profound and so practical through the incarnation we come to what we're all preparing for in Lent and that is the Paschal mystery where we have the memorial of his passion his death his resurrection and his ascension into heaven and you realize that the Paschal mystery is precisely what we celebrate in the mass what we have in the Holy Eucharist that this is Christ and in a matter of weeks you know, I don't mean to get too personal but our son Jeremiah is in the seminary, and our other son, Joe, we have five sons and one daughter, but two of the sons are preparing to be become priests. And I've, I know I've shared this with you in the past, but on May 21st, Lord willing, Jeremiah is going to be empowered as a mortal man to transform bread and wine, earthly matter, into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. Seriously, my boy mm -hmm. is going to become sort of like my supernatural father and breadwinner. It's, it's, it's amazing to me as Catholics how unamazed we are at, at all of these mysteries that we profess. You know, it's, it's a wonder that we believe them. It's not a wonder that the world doesn't, but it is a wonder that we don't share it with the world with that kind of freedom that is our birthright as children of God, as brothers and sisters in Christ, because Jesus might be in heaven, but he didn't say to Pilate, my kingship is not in this world. He said, my kingship is not of this world. So there's no one in this world he doesn't claim from heaven on earth. You know, he points to every single child, every single man and woman and says, you're mine. I purchased you. I love you. I loved you into existence. And now I want to love you into eternity. And I mean, if this is why we're on the planet, we can get through pandemics and also confusing presidential elections or whatever else comes our way. In fact, my power is made perfect in weakness, our Lord promises us through St. Paul. And so I'm not by nature an optimist, but I am by supernatural grace, hope filled, because I do think that the best is yet to come and it's going to be around hmm, for trillions of years. We call that eternal life. And so, you know, I, I do think that uh, reminding ourselves of the solidarity that we share. And, and by the way, one, other, one last thought. You mentioned Cicero because JFK did in, uh, in his speech, and we, we tend to forget that, that JFK and his speech writers were steeped in this tradition. But what yeah. is often overlooked is the fact that Cicero himself, in one of his most important works, De Officiis, identifies religion as a virtue that all should share. Now, he was not someone who was exceptionally devout. But on the other hand, he was somebody who was exceptionally smart. And when he expounds the virtue of justice, he basically explains that religion is not a matter of private devotion or personal taste. It is a matter of public justice. What is he talking about? Well, he was basically talking about the same thing as Plato and Aristotle and Seneca, his fellow Roman. But Cicero is picked up by St. Augustine, by St. Aqu Thomas Aquinas, because 
when we think of justice, and we explain this together in the book, Brendan McGinley and I, justice is simply giving to others what we owe them. You know, and it's easy to do at one level. We call it commutative justice. It's transactional. It's commercial. You go to the store, you, you buy groceries, we'll pay for them. Yeah, but there is a higher justice than commutative. It's distributive. That is how we treat our neighbors, how we respond to our society, social justice, the common good, equity and all fairness and all of that. But Cicero recognized that there's actually a higher form of justice than the commutative and then the distributive or social justice. And these forms of justice he described as sort of being transcendent because you can't pay your parents back by giving them life, food, clothing, shelter, love and nurture like they gave you. So what do you do in justice? You honor your father and mother. And likewise, you can't repay God because he's given you everything you have, everything you are. So what do you do? Religio. Religio is the highest form of justice for Cicero. And justice is the chief virtue of all of the others. Honesty, thrift, integrity, humility, magnanimity, and so on. Justice is the highest virtue and religion is the highest form of justice and sacrifice, he recognizes, just as Aristotle defended the Athenians and their constitution by saying we need public altars, we need religious observance, we need sacrifice in order to sanction the oaths of office and this sort of thing. The pagans in antiquity were understanding the role of religion to form the social bonds that lead to civilization. You know, and I think that we have a lot more to learn from the ancients than we're often aware of. And, you know, I, I, I would say this, that not only does St. Thomas Aquinas quote Cicero, he also refers to religio in question 81 of the Secunda Secunda of the Summa Theologica. He says that religio is the virtus virtutum, the virtue of virtues. I mean, that's an amazing statement because what he's implying is that in order to have a virtuous life, you know, he explains virtues as being more than just obeying commandments. Virtues are to the soul what muscles are to the body. They enable us to do more and more good, more and more easily and more and more frequently, and not just as individuals, but also as citizens, as family members and that sort of thing. And so when you recognize that we're all trying to live virtuous lives, well, how do you coordinate it? You know, I'm, I'm reminded of the fact that, you know, in our, in our town, we've got a number of great musicians. You could call them virtuosos. But if they all just gathered together and began to play, it would be an awful sound. You need someone to coordinate virtuoso musicians. And that would be the conductor. And that is the role of religion. Uh, the Lord God has this capacity to coordinate our lives to produce harmony to lead us to beauty and that sort of thing. And, you know, I don't expect to see this by tomorrow morning or next week. But on the other hand, what we can recognize is that living out our faith in a generous way with zeal and joy is going to make this more contagious in a life-giving way than COVID-19 could ever be. And I come back to the sense that you know, this is not just like religious rhetoric. You know, this is not just, you know, the exaggerated hyperbole of some guy who converted 35 years ago who can't seem to get out of the system. This, this is reality. This is objectivity. We have reality on our side. And so the more we can escape a Stockholm syndrome, point ourselves in the right direction and run the right way, we'll score you know, a touchdown for our team. And we're also going to become saints in the process. And so wherever we are, whatever we're called upon to do, there really is a sense in which just as leaven is hidden in the bread that causes it to rise, so our faith and our lives in our culture, even if they're overcome by secularism or divided by all kinds of religious divisions, yet we still have hope. And I'm convinced that, you know, in Power of Philippines, that there really is a sense in which celebrating the 500th anniversary on the 16th of March. And then, you know, three days later, celebrating for the first time in church history, an entire year consecrated yeah. to St. Joseph, the patron of the universal church. And patron does not just mean, well, a client who comes to the store. 
patron comes from Pater. He is the human being as father who really reflects God the Father more profoundly and more universally than I do for my kids. And it's really, to me, a great sign of hope. Uh, you know, the darkest hour comes right before dawn, you know, and so we may face all kinds of opposition here in my country, over there as well, or everywhere else. But I, I, I do believe that God wants to allow us to exhaust all of our resources to basically run out of gas, you know, by secularism or whatever else you want to call this idolatry. And then he's going to come to our aid. We don't know when it's going to happen. We don't know where. But I think we can say this, that uh, Christ is not done with the human race. The Great Commission is not complete. And so, you know, again, I'm not, I'm not an actuarial expert, so I can't give you the statistical likelihood that it's going to happen in the next year or two. But as Catholics, you know, we, we have to be involved in our society. We have to think in terms of election cycles. But it's more than just planting a fall crop so that we have food for the winter. There really is a sense in which, as Catholics, the best thing we can do for our countries is to think in terms of years, generations, centuries, as Catholics should, because that way we're not just going to plant the fall crop, we're going to plant forests so that our grandkids will have wood to build their houses, you know, to, uh, to make furniture and to... Uh, to put in their fireplace so that they can cook food and that kind of thing. We're thinking long-term, even though we're living in the here and now. Thank you, Dr. Han. Truly, the Filipinos need a sign of hope. And, and, and this is more relevant than, than any other time. I, for, the, for our viewers who are just tuning in, we are talking about Dr. Scott Han's book, It is Right and Just, Why the Future of Civilization depends on true religion. I, I apologize for the, <laughs> for the markers. This is, his, this is his book. And um, for those of you who, who, who seem to be asking, well, that sounds familiar. It's, it's uh, because it is. Uh, it's one of the most ancient dialogues that's present in liturgy. Dignum et justum est. It is right and just. It's part of the mass. And I, I'd have to confess that even for myself, I, you know, I attend the mass and I gloss over uh, this this most ancient of dialogues. It is truly right and just to give him thanks and praise. It is our duty in our salvation, always and everywhere. I mean, Dr. Han, you talk about uh, how religion, how praise and honor given to him is a matter of justice. Um, but could you talk about how it is also a matter of our, our salvation um, in, 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 the, in the liturgy? What I'd like to do is for our fellow Filipinos that whenever they attend the Mass and they hear this, they will not just think about the book, but what its relevance is. Wow. Yeah, thanks for asking, Jude. Um, I just want to say something, and that is to hear you refer to the title and the line in the liturgy the way you just did with such clarity and zeal, uh, my heart skipped a beat. And I hope others too. I'm, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. Um, yeah. Thank you, boy. I, I get the sense that we have this solidarity in zeal and thanksgiving with the both of you, but also with who knows how many thousands of others too. And you know, when we hear the title, it is right and just, it would be tempting to think, well, he's just lifting a line from the liturgy that we have repeated all of our lives, you know, and maybe he's trying to inject it with meaning that goes beyond what I've sensed. But I mean, this line, you know, like I have with other books that I've written called Hail Holy Queen or Lord Have Mercy. This idea of Sirsum Corda, lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. And then when we hear that we are to give him thanks and praise, we are to give thanks to the Lord. It is right and just. Dignum et justum est. It is our dignity. It is our right. But it is also our duty and our salvation. But let's just take a step back and realize that if it is right and just to give him thanks and praise, what does that imply? Well, it is wrong not to. It would be unjust to not acknowledge God as the source of life, as the source of order, as the goal of our existence. And so if it's right and just to give him thanks and praise, it's wrong and unjust. And it's not a little injustice. It isn't a misdemeanor. You know, it isn't, it isn't a venial sin. It really is mortal. It really is a felony. It really is a crime 
a cosmic crime to not acknowledge God. And you know, the catechism it might surprise people to recognize that in 2105, we read that the duty of offering God genuine worship becomes, let's see, concerns man both individually and socially. This is the traditional Catholic teaching on the moral duty of individuals and societies toward the true religion and the one church of Christ. Now, I realize that maybe after 500 years and three days, Filipinos might look back and say, well, that was then, but this is now. Uh -huh. now the fact is, Christ is still the Lord of Lords, and it is our duty, it is our salvation. God gets, gets nothing out of our worship. It isn't for his sake. He's not some kind of cosmic ego, egomaniac who says, hey, all eyes on me, worship me, no one else. He gets nothing out of it, but we get everything out of it. And even though it seems like, wow, the clock has run out, we've run our course, there's nothing left, it's not true. You know, and it, it, this, is, <clears throat> this is something so timely for Filipinos and for Catholics who are in America, because we're still in the midst of the new evangelization. John Paul referred to the 1990s as the Advent season of the new evangelization. So when the last decade of the previous century was over, it's like the first four Sundays in the liturgical year. This was never just a, you know, a short-term <laughs> fix. This was a long-term strategy. And he defined the new evangelization as re-evangelizing the de-Christianized. Well, hello. I mean, that's who we are. That's what we need. And so the catechism goes on to say, not only that this is the traditional Catholic teaching and the moral duty of individuals and societies toward the true religion and the one church of Christ, it points out the way. By constantly evangelizing people, the church works toward enabling them to infuse the Christian spirit into the mentality and mores, but also the laws and structures of the communities in which they live. The social duty of Christians is to respect and awaken in each person the love of the true and the good. It requires them to make known the worship of the one true religion which subsists in the Catholic and Apostolic Church, and it goes on to talk about the kingship of Christ, not just as spiritual and personal and private, but as social and public as well. He is the king of kings. We're not imposing our religion upon other people. This might seem like fighting words or hate speech or whatever, but this is a message of love. And if we live it properly, and if we're patient with other people, as well as recognizing how patient God is with us, I do think it's going to gain traction. But regardless, it's going to make us saints. Even if it doesn't form a civilization of love in our own lifetime, nevertheless, we, we recognize that it's never enough to, to want holiness just for myself. You know, I want to be holy, but not my wife. Yeah, she's on her own. No, of course not. I mean, it's holy matrimony for a reason. Okay, so I want to be holy, and I want my wife to be, but not my kids. No, oh, that's absurd. I want my wife. I want my kids, but not the neighbors, not the neighbor's kids. Well, I mean, that would be to betray the Great Commission. Okay, so I want my neighborhood to know the faith, but not the city of Steubenville. Well, you can't draw the line there either. Well, okay, my town, but not, not all the other towns in Ohio. Well, no, my state, but not the other 49 states. My country, okay, fine, my country, but not all the other nations. There is nowhere you can draw the line because there's not a square inch of this planet Jesus doesn't point to and say, that's mine. I purchased that with my own blood just as I created that by the power of God. And so this is just sanctified common sense. It isn't some kind of hyped up religious rhetoric you know, for overzealous Catholics. It really is what it means to be Catholic and what it means to understand the church's teaching. And I think it's really exciting. It makes... It makes it more bearable, more enjoyable to go out into a culture that is conflicted and that is in conflict with the church for no good reason and to surprise people by showing them that this will actually make more sense out of life, but it's also going to show a lot of nonsense that parades itself as though it is science or whatever it calls itself. Right. Dr. Hunt, allow me to share a compelling story, which is also an important aspect of the Philippine history in light of today's topic. 
in the Philippines in 1983, a senator whom everyone loved, my family, my parents, the entire nation loved. His name is Senator Benigno Ninoy Aquino Jr., from whose name the International Airport in Manila was named after, Ninoy Aquino International Airport. He was assassinated in 1983, and I was only 10 years old at that time. But before his assassination, he was a political detainee right in his homeland. He put himself to hunger strike because of that. He was he, t he suffered a terrible solitary confinement that caused him to be so sick, he needed to be medically excelled in Boston for a cardiac surgery. While in Boston, in America, 700 Club's Pat Robertson interviewed mm -hmm. him. And I thought that I would like to share with you a riveting part of his answer in his speech. He says, well, I'm a Catholic. I was born a Catholic and 85% of the Filipino people are Christians, as you know that, but we never really read the Bible as Catholics. I don't know why. And we were instinctively Catholic. We believed in God, but as a young man, I had no time for God. I was too busy with my politics. I was moving on and I thought I was self-contained. I thought in my own steam, I can make it. I, I only went to God when I needed his help. When the votes were coming in, I would say, dear Lord, help me. But when the votes are in, I forget the Lord. But when I was placed in deep solitary confinement, nobody to talk to, I became desperate. And here I started to question the fundamentals of my belief. Firstly, is there really a God? I began to doubt that. I said, if there is a God, why should I be here? What have I done? Why are the crooks all out? And so I asked the second question, was there a God when the children were gassed at Auschwitz, at Buchenwald, at Dachau, where was he? Where is this God when people are dying at Sahel? And that was a doubt that has sealed my mind. But then I felt there must be a God because then all of this suffering would be useless. I mean, if I'm suffering like this and there is no God, who would ever reward me? Who would ever pay me back? So there must be a God. So I felt then maybe it's a foolish consolation. I had to even invent him if there is no God, because that's the only way you can survive. Without him, Pat, you will never make it. And as St. Paul said, I am strongest when I was weakest. And I became strongest when I'm down there at the floor in solitary confinement alone. And it's only when he came to me that I really felt strongest. And therefore, now I have survived all of my vicissitudes because I know that there is God interceding for us. I had to share this, Dr. Han, because first, Senator Aquino was right. Most of the Filipinos are born Catholics, just like what Jude and I. But we can also be instinctively passive when it comes to proclaiming our faith in the public arena. And second, because this powerful testimony came straight from the mouth of a politician, a political detainee whose death became the catalyst of what would be the bloodless people power revolution that steered not only the entire nation of the Philippines, but also of the entire world to the core, where Christian faith was simply not just instrumental, but also at the front and center of the Philippine history. You see nuns armed with only rosaries. rosaries praying in the streets, the faithless, unarmed and weaponless, barricading these huge military tanks by their bodies, with their bodies. I thought that not only was that historic and poignant, but also a supernatural hand of God. So I have to share that, Dr. Hunt, well, any perspective well, on that? Well, thank you for sharing that, but I mean, what you referenced was in our news, our headlines, front page news, what the Filipinas were going through back in the 80s. And uh, I must admit, I became a Catholic about three years after that. But watching the heroism and the, the faithful witness of the nuns with their rosaries, but also of tens of thousands of Filipino Catholics in the face of this sort of tyrannical opposition, it stirred every heart over here as well. And I realized that that was a long time ago. For most people, it just seems like, you know, far away, 
a long distant time but that that the sparks are still there and i realize that you're facing a different kind of opposition from the political order right now but that same faithfulness reminds us that we should not give into the fear of suffering which paralyzes us we should recognize that for whatever reason god seems to prefer to use suffering to bring not only salvation but also to bring joy and that that suffering i remember this about six years ago when my mother was dying of bone cancer uh, that when she accepted the fact that there still is a god he still loves me he's allowed this not in spite of his love but because of it she found a peace and a joy in the midst of pain that purified her love for god and her love for me and my sister and my brother and my father was deceased at that point, but it also softened some of the memories that she had that seemed a little bit harsh. And that isn't just true for my mom. That wasn't just true for that senator. It's true for each and every single one of us. So when we recognize, okay, that the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords got to the throne through the cross, you know, no cross, no crown, no pain, no gain for him, but for us. He doesn't do it to spare us from suffering and dying. He did it to endow our suffering and our deaths with a redemptive value and a redemptive power and a transforming power that, you know, you look at this and you can say, no wonder the world doesn't believe. It's, it's too good to be true. It's, it's too divinely strange. And yet it is the only thing that makes sense out of the fact that there is all powerful, all loving God, and yet he allows suffering. Why? As Aquinas would say, because he accomplishes greater good through suffering than there would be apart from it. And it's like, okay, well, who can do that? Only one person, and that is God. And so we have to express that faith together publicly internalize that faith through personal prayer, but then also allow that faith like a pebble in the pond to send out ripples because the ripple effect of the suffering of Christ on the cross, achieving the salvation of the world, and yet he turns around and asks us to carry our cross. Again, it's so easy to say, I've heard this all of my lives. You know, I've heard all my life. It's, it's, it's beautiful rhetoric, but it's not much more than that allow it to rise to the level of the reality that we face today, here and now, whatever problems we have. You know, we don't have to wait for Senator Aquino to come along and then say, okay, at long last. I mean, we, we pray for those kinds of transforming leaders. But at the same time, just through the ordinary little things of today and tomorrow, great good can be accomplished for the kingdom of heaven uh, here on earth. Uh, through the little chores that we do with a lot of love that nobody notices. And that, to me, is heroic sanctity as much as standing in front of a tank. And I, I, I'm convinced of that. And I think what we have to do is just to do it and find out it's true. Every day, it's true. Wow. Dr. Hahn, just, uh, just like a, as a physician, I could sense that secularism has gotten a large foothold uh, or is starting to get a large foothold in, in the Philippines. It's concerning because we just celebrated our 500 years of Christianity. Um, it, is, it is well emphasized by a lot of the folks that we've talked to, uh, some of the speakers like uh, Father Chris Alar, uh, Deacon Harold Burke Siver, Steve yeah. Ray and Chris Stefanik have mentioned that the Philippines is, is actually the gateway for Christianity in Asia and together with Poland, hopefully in the world. But, but I, I fear that we are headed towards a, a trajectory of secularism and, and moral relativism uh, that, that, that is true of the United States, where you will get, if you, were, if you dare stand up or, or come out uh, with your personal religious views, you get canceled. Um, I, I worry that if we don't start practicing our religion freely and with zeal and vigor in, in society, that society will practice its secularism as a religion uh, to us. What would you advise the Filipinos uh, to avoid trudging down that same path uh, that America is unfortunately in now? Well, here again, I think there's a balance that needs to be struck and it's, 
it's not hard. It's just humanly impossible without the Holy Spirit. And on the one hand, we have to have the courage to stand up and speak out, especially when we're afraid of being canceled, uh, of people who claim to be woke but are deeply asleep to the things that matter most. Stand up, speak out, be courageous, be fearless. And on the other hand, be joyful. And that's what's so hard. How do you, how do you have joy as you're trying to overcome fear? Well, unless our lives are grounded in prayer, unless our prayer is grounded in the sacraments, unless the sacraments are what unite us to the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings and Our Lady, who is the Queen of Heaven and Earth, and to St. Joseph, who is the patron of the Universal Church. And, and this goes beyond platitudes. This goes beyond doctrine. This has to be something that we realize, you know, we just had a bad storm all day yesterday. You know, you couldn't see the sun for 24 hours. And it's easy to conclude, well, it might be there. It might be, you know, it might not be. Well, of course it is. You know, today, blue skies. And so we're going to go through storms where the puddles seem to be more real than the sun that we can't see. But our faith enables us to lift up our hearts and our minds and our lives and whatever adverse circumstances we face. And that is the source of joy. And I think the joy of the Lord is our strength, and it's the one thing that the world doesn't have. It's the one thing the world doesn't understand, but it's the one thing that the world wants. I, I, they have pleasures, but they leave people jaded, addicted, burned out, fried. But we have joy in the midst of suffering, and in fact, joy that is refined by suffering. And if there is one thing I associate with Filipino Catholics, it is joy, you know, it is energy, it is excitement, it is zeal. And so don't give in to the discouragement. I understand why, if you do, but I can also say you should be able to understand why you don't need to give in to discouragement or despair. And so leave it in the hands of God, what he will do with our courage, our fearlessness, standing up, speaking out, speaking the truth, even though it's unpopular, and at the same time, if we don't have that joy and that blessed happiness that comes from knowing who we are as beloved sons and daughters of God, if we simply have the anger, we end up empowering our opponents. See how reactive they are. Oh, this reactionary movement called the Catholic faith. It's not just for our sake. It's not just for God's sake. It is for the sake of the godless that we can show that sort of joy, that sort of peace, that patience, that humility that comes from knowing that I am a son of God and not just a citizen who can't get my way in the next election. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful, wonderfully said. Um, Dr. Han, there are archdioceses that are cross-posting this and that are mm -hmm. listening to this, bishops and, and, and priests. Uh, and I'm hoping that they, I, this is how I feel, Teresa and I feel, that this book, It Is Right and Just, Why the Future of Civilization depends on true religion, hopefully can be part of, of, their, of their curriculum in, in the seminary, or um, I, I think it needs to be taught. Mm -hmm. I do too, you know, I remember 35 years ago, discovering in the sacraments and in the saints and in all of the statues and images that there's this physical side of being spiritual that as Protestants, you don't recognize, you don't practice. But the, the physical side of being spiritual also points to the social and the political side of being spiritual. You don't reduce the faith to political action or political programs or to some kind of liberation agenda that ignores the primacy of the spiritual, that heaven is over earth. The soul is immortal, whereas the body is going to need to be resurrected. You know, but once you get that, the physical side of being spiritual, but also the social side of being Catholic. You know, I, I think what we recognize is this book is not written to be a political manifesto, but it is written, written to be a kind of spiritual manifesto that we need to get out of the bank vault, but we also need to get out of the spiritual Stockholm syndrome and celebrate the fact that we are free, whether we're hostages in a bank vault in Stockholm or whether we're berated by uh, a president uh, there or here, the fact is, we are sons and daughters of God. And if you celebrate our faith and welcome us, we'll be grateful. But if you persecute us, we will be purified and perfected. 
And in the process of becoming a spectacle, I think we're going to recognize, again, not just election cycles, not just planting this crop for the fall harvest, but we're planting spiritual forests for the sake of our great kids and our grandkids and our great grandkids. And I, you know, I not only have the two sons in the seminary with Kimberly, but also we have another son, our oldest, who's a professor of scripture at Mount St. Mary's Seminary. But we've got 20 grandkids. We've got a lot of skin in the game, as we say in, in the U.S. But so do you. So do all of us have skin in the game. You might say the flesh and blood of Christ in the Holy Eucharist that now is in us makes it so that uh, we have got to stand up, speak out, but also not allow the world to rob us of the joy that that, that represents our birthright. And we have enough examples in the lives of the saints and, and people like Senator Aquino and others. And it's like, wow, let's stop giving in to sadness. Mm -hmm. That is the ally of the devil. Beautifully said. So I think we don't have, yeah. we want to be respectful of your time, Dr. Han. We were just not sure if we had questions on Facebook. I, I have, <laughs> Skyler, if we have any, just let us know. <laughs> but, okay. but it looks like um, um, this is just chock full of things to unpack. Um, and I'm certain, just like many of our viewers who follow us, follow us on Facebook, this is replayable. Uh, please uh, share it on YouTube. Uh, uh, shared uh, in, in Facebook and, and follow us because um, this is especially especially today's topic. Uh, it's it, hopefully it will Christianize the Philippines a little bit more, much like the early Christians did Christianizing Rome. Yeah, Dr. Scott Han. Um, how do we how do we how do we tune into your ministry, Dr. Han? Would you like to tell the viewers so they can know how to reach you? Very much so, yes. 20 years ago, Kimberly and I formed the St. Paul Center to represent a sort of legacy, not only for our kids and our grandkids, but for our brothers and sisters in Christ, Catholic, Christian, non-Christian too. And so you can go to stpaulcenter.com, that's stpaulcenter.com. And our publishing arm is called Emmaus Road. And that's who published It Is Right and Just, as well as the book we discussed last year, Hope to Die, The Christian Union of Death and the Resurrection of the Body. But we have uh, literally hundreds of other resources. Perhaps the one I am most passionate about is the one that we have just produced as part of our Real Presence project to reinvigorate the Eucharistic faith of Catholics after the lockdown is over. We want to see, you know, not a trickle of Catholics coming back, but a veritable flood, uh, a tidal wave. And so we have this thing called the Bible and the Mass, Parousia, which in Greek means real presence, person mm. presence. Christ's presence. And the Bible and the Mass is something that was professionally produced by R.D. Delgado, working with me and the center. It's available now, live streaming throughout all of Lent. So we've got two more weeks, and I would encourage our viewers to really tap into this and to do it not only personally, but also as families, as parishes, and that sort of thing, because we've had over 100,000 people let us know that this has just set fire to their hearts. It's really given them a sense of Eucharistic amazement as Pope St. John Paul II called for. And I'll say it again, it's amazing to me how unamazed Catholics are by our faith, by the, the mystery of the Eucharist. And so we need to become re-amazed, not just devout, that's important, but that fire has got to be reignited within us. And that, I think, will also spread to many other people who don't even see it coming. And so the St. Paul Center, uh, Emmaus Road, uh, the Bible and the Mass, and we have other programs that we call Journey Through Scripture, the Bible and the Sacraments, a professionally produced video series, the Bible and the Virgin Mary, also the Bible and the Church Fathers. For beginners, intermediate, and advanced, there's just so many resources that uh, will make Catholics there in the Philippines and everywhere else into Bible Christians, you know, where evangelical Catholic doesn't have to be, well, you're one or you're the other. No, you're both. And you end up discovering that the more Catholic you are, the more excited you are about sharing the faith, evangelizing. And this is the passion that is on our hearts. And it is also the inspiration behind all of the projects that we have. Biblical literacy for Catholic lay people biblical fluency for our clergy and our educators 
So please check out the St. Paul Center, Emmaus Road. We also have a number of textbooks that come from Emmaus Academic. About 25 seminarians from the Philippines sent me. Jan, if you're listening, you know I'm grateful. The 25 copies of this book, Truth is Synthesis. I'm so excited about this connection, this alliance, this partnership with Empower Philippines. So thank you, thank you both, but also thanks to all of our brothers and sisters over there. You inspire us. You know that Brazil is the most Catholic country and it's facing hardships. Mexico second, the U.S. third, but the Philippines are fourth. And I pray that you catch up and overtake us and really allow the faith to spread throughout the world because you are there in Asia at the most critical time in history at a crucial place on this planet. May God bless all of my Filipino brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you, Dr. Han. Thank you. You are an inspiration to us. You and uh, uh, Kimberly Han have inspired us in, 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 in a personal level. Um, thank you, St. Paul Center. Um, uh, Dr. Han, would you mind closing us in prayer? To be honored to. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, you are the creator of the universe. And by your power and your wisdom and your goodness, you sustain the galaxies and the subatomic particles and everything in between. And this is reality. This is truth. And in the name of Jesus, your eternal son, our savior and Lord, the king of kings, we ask you now to send the Holy Spirit down upon us, upon our bodies and souls, upon our marriages and our families, upon our neighborhoods and our towns, upon our cities and our nations, that the world might know what your son accomplished. We might know that you are a father like no other. And in this year of St. Joseph, we pray that you would empower him through his prayer to release those graces that this world needs desperately now more than ever before. But also we ask you to bless those sons and daughters of yours who are broken, who are facing despair, illness, suffering, poverty, hardship. We ask that you would manifest the reality of your love as Abba Father to them. We ask all of these things with gratitude, with joy, and with filial confidence as your beloved children. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of Son, the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Joseph, pray for us. Pray for us. Thank you, Dr. Heim. God bless you. We will do this again soon. Look forward to that so much, Judy Christian. Thank you so much for this outreach, for this ministry, for this partnership. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Dr. Heim. Heim. God bless you. God bless you. The honor is ours to have you today. Thank you. So... That is, we just spoke about, it is right and just. And I, I'm hoping that this was fruitful and helpful for particularly for, for our men and women of cloth, right? Um, because they can be the catalyst for, for change in our country. Um, even, if, um, e even if it's... Uh, even if it's um, Dr. Scott, Dr. Scott, Scott Han just called me, um, but um, but yeah, even 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 if it takes four hundred years, another five hundred years to Christianize uh, the Philippines, right? Yeah, so Re -Christianize. yeah, I echo Jude, uh, who says that in the Holy Eucharist, it is the priest. It is right. It is right and just, and we as lay we we, we repeat it is right and just. So it is our hope and intention, our prayerful intention, as we celebrate our Christian nation, 500 years of being a Christian nation, that we will all be in this together, so that even if we will not see it happen in this world, we will see it in heaven together with everyone. We yeah. hope that this conversation inspired you to be more spiritually active, more spiritually Nourished. invigorated and nourished so that we help each other along yeah. the way yeah um we we want we promised father john nathaniel m cube or kube uh -huh. from saint vincent de paul at old catalan along the uh, to pray for his parish and ministry for the poor um but for all those of our for, for all our listeners for those of you out there um who are struggling um know that that there is hope this is a sign of hope for us. Um, things are going to get better. I, I, our prayers are with you, and the, and, and and the prayers of, of, 
the nation of all the Catholic uh, church are centered and geared towards our 500 years of Christianity. Yes, and so we're looking forward to next conversation, which will not be until April, and we will make sure that we update you. Yes. For our Thank you, Empowers. Thank you for joining us today. God bless you. Maraming salamat, Maraming salamat po. Po. Happy feast day to St. Joseph to everybody.